I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. I think we'd probably be better friends if I wasn't trying to get him sacked. It's slightly awkward that we want to end each other's careers. <laughs> Chris Minns, Premier Perrottet, welcome to Straight Talk. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Mark. Do we trust the government? Gladys Berejiklian is fighting for her job. The former Labor minister was today sentenced. How do you think about what went down during the beads and all that sort of stuff. It was appalling behaviour. We've got ICAC in New South Wales. It's an important institution. When you make a mistake, you just own up to it. The rent has got out of control. How do you tackle housing? We've got to unlock more land, but we've got to build the infrastructure as well. I was always taught to take the job seriously, and I do take it really seriously, but I don't take myself too seriously. Or in government, it's always, it's always focused on the here and now. But what about the future? Australians are a lot more sceptical, somewhat cynical about politicians. There's a lot of similarity between the two of you. He speaks yep. well of you. Yep. And, I speak well of him. And you speak well of him. Do you think he's ready for what you've experienced? Premier Perrottet, welcome to Straight Talk. Thanks, Mark. Great to be here. I'm actually honoured to have the Premier of New South Wales sitting in the hot seat. Right, we're in the middle of an election. You're on a really tight budget in terms of time. So let's cut to the chase. I want to know about what you announced on Sunday. That's the very first thing I want to know. I'm a grandfather. Yeah. And I'm, I got a grandkid. Yeah. And, uh, my, and I got four sons and, uh, hopefully I got some more grandkids on their way. Hopefully. Well, I think maybe I have. And so I thought to myself, What's the research say behind that? So how are you responding to the research and what people in New South Wales yeah. want? Well, we, we know, Mark, we had a Productivity Commission review here in New South Wales and what it's shown in terms of housing and education that the intergenerational gap uh, uh, going forward is going to create more and more challenges for our kids and we've got to look at new ways of giving them that financial support. And we also know that many parents uh, don't provide and save for their children's future. So the idea behind this scheme uh, was to help kids uh, from birth all the way through to 18 to save and their parents save and ultimately at the end of it they've got a nest egg there to help them with education and with getting a deposit for their first home. I mean we do a lot with superannuation and, and you know we look after the elderly once, they, once they've retired and that sets them up and obviously alleviates pressure on federal budgets uh, but I often thought when I was treasurer of the state why don't we do anything for our children? So we worked on it for some time um, and uh, we announced it on Sunday. I guess people don't realise this, but you do do polling and research and you get to find out what what certain cohorts of voters think is important. Mm. Now, some people might say that's, uh, you know, you're just playing the game, throwing money around the joint to mm. win votes. But at the end of the day, that's what your job is, to make sure that you satisfy what people want. Yeah, well, I think it's important that what we don't do is, and, and I've always been passionate, like focus groups aren't there to run policy for the government. You know, you can test ideas um, and see what people think. It might be a way that you communicate a policy that can help you. Um, And this is an idea that I had back when I was treasurer. And if we could start every child uh, who's born in New South Wales with $400, match contributions from parents and grandparents, dollar for dollar, all the way up to $1,000, we could end up in a situation uh, where our children are leaving school with up to $49,000 in their account. So uh, we tested it over time in terms of new ways of doing it or what the thresholds should be. Uh, but I think where we've landed it um, makes the most sense where we'll, we'll contribute as a state up to $400 uh, for every child if that co-contribution is matched. Every year? Every year. So let's say my grandson's born, you know, in nine months' time, yep. what happens on the day he's born, there's $400. Yeah, go arrived. to Service New South Wales. Yep. Day one. Yep. Set up an account. Yep. Uh, we'll immediately deposit $400 in yeah. and that for every year we will match parents and grandparents' contribution dollar for dollar up, up to, to 400 Um, And then the parent or the grandparent can contribute up to $1,000. We're targeting a return of 7% every year, but we're guaranteeing 4%. So on those numbers, if you're getting a 7% return every year, you get up to $49,000 by the time uh, the child is 18. And then from that point, they've got two options. They can start to withdraw it for education, for hex, for textbooks, uh, for tools if you're you're doing an apprenticeship. Um, And then, uh, or you can continue to contribute yourself. The government contribution stops. But you just think about it, right? Like every child when they're 18, they're starting 
with a deposit. They're starting with a built up nest egg and that will encourage them to continue to save as well. I think I'm very passionate about teaching our children financial literacy and getting parents to think about that more. And in government, it's always it's about focus. Groups. It's always focused on the here and now, but what about the future? And that's our obligation, I think, as a government is to make sure our kids have better opportunities than we do. And this investment will be you know, repaid many times over in my view. The intergenerational gap, do you explain mm-hmm. what that means? I just think that the gap in the cost of health and education that our children will face compared to us And they believe that's going to grow and grow over time. Now, half of that is the government's problem in terms of looking at, okay, well, you know, we've got to balance the budget. We've got to look at new ways of doing things to make sure uh, that those costs to the state aren't increasing. But we're also seeing the cost of housing getting more and more out of reach for children. And that's the best thing we can do is get young people into home ownership. It grows, it grows their wealth. But at the same time, I also want parents. It's hard, right? Like, Being a parent, balancing work and family life is really difficult. Don't worry, I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. Well, I get it. (laughs) I get it. But but if we can just get to a point where I think if parents sit there and think, well, hold on, the government's helping me here. If I can put $8 a week, $8, that's two cups of coffee, $8 a week aside, then I can have a situation where my child, from the date they're born, when they leave school at 18, has that money there to help them with their education and also to get that deposit. It's funny. It's like the old-fashioned endowment policies mm. that my mum and dad actually have one for me. Oh, by the way, my mum told me when she was alive, when you were treasurer, yeah. she said to me one day, we were watching TV before she passed away because she had she had MND, and um, we were watching and uh, she wrote down a piece of paper about you, you were treasurer. I like that young man. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, this is a long time. This is yeah. a few years ago. Yeah. And she said, I like that young man. And... Uh, and you obviously to her, you're a young man, but yeah. that's not a bad endorsement coming from my mum. Um, in terms of housing, I just want to talk to you about housing right now. Of course, housing prices will go up. Fifty thousand yeah. may not be as big of a deposit as it is today then, because yeah. you, you've got to add the future value money. But nonetheless, it's, it goes towards it. Yeah. How do you tackle housing? Because I'd imagine it is a big issue in New South Wales Massive. for especially kids between young people between twenty and say forty who are either trying to rent or trying to save a deposit. How do we address that problem in terms of supply? Because really at the end of the day, we need more supply. Yep, we do. And so part of that is I think we've got to unlock more land, but we've got to build the infrastructure as well. So, for example, we're building metro trains out to Western Sydney. We've got that new airport coming on. We are changing the way uh, that Sydney looks before our very eyes. And I was out the other day at at the new airport metro station. You know, what was once a paddock is still a paddock, but a, a massive metro construction site right in the middle of it. In 10 years' time, this will transform into a new city. Um, and if you build the infrastructure, then the housing comes off the back of it. So we've got to keep opening that up. We've got to work with councils. And we've put a lot of work into accelerated infrastructure funds for that you know, ancillary sewerage and water. That's going to unlock about 140,000 new homes. The best way to help our children get in the housing market is to build more homes, first and foremost. If we build more homes, increase supply, uh, then we'll be in a position where we can get you know, less pressure on the housing market. Because it, it's, I, read, I read an article the other day that said something like over 70% of parents do not believe their kids will ever be able to buy a home. And that's staggering. That is a staggering number. Um, and it's becoming harder and harder. So we've got to look at new and innovative ways of doing it. But supply is the key. Number one is supply. I think the second aspect then is, you know, I'm, I, I don't like stamp duty. I've never liked it. I think it's a terrible, terrible tax. It stops productivity growth and it stops young people getting into the housing market. And you think about the time it takes to save like $50,000 in stamp duty. By the time they've done that, it's taken two years the property market's increased and they're just further and further behind. So that's why one of the policies I've put together is to give first home buyers the choice of either paying that upfront stamp duty or paying a smaller annual amount. And then I announced recently that they will now have that choice for the rest of their life. So they'll make the decisions that best suit their needs. And I've always said treasurers make great premiers, by the way. It's certainly in New South Wales. That has been history. Well, you learn a lot about all the areas of government well, because you're, you're funding it. Totally. Because then, yeah, I, I think that's an important, an important sort of um, observation in New South Wales in particular that I've seen and a lot of the great premiers have been treasurers in the past. Well, Baird, Glad well, and me, all three were treasurers. Correct. And I, I wanted, I was going to ask you, in relation to that pay land tax annually versus pay stamp duty once, 
if you sell the property after two years, mm-hmm. do you have to keep paying the land tax? No. So, so you, would, you would have paid a smaller amount for two years? Yeah. So, so let's just take a $50,000 property. You might yeah. pay a few thousand dollars a year. You do that for two years. You sell your property. Bang. That's it. That's, that's, you, it's all, all, all done. Very similar to council rates. Yeah. So it sort of makes a bit of sense in that um, because I'm in the home loan business and the average person in Australia, I, I don't know about New South Wales and Australia, only stays in their place these days for about five or six years. Five, six years. Yeah. So that they're out. So it seems to me that... If I was trying to, if I'm say, talking to my kids and I'm trying to advise them how to arbitrage stamp duty, the upfront cost, I would definitely advise them to take, yeah. pay the land tax or to take the land tax option. Yeah. And I think it makes a lot of sense for younger people. I mean, you say, Mark, and I agree with you, it's about six to seven years or so on average. But I think younger people, the next generation, will move around a lot more. And they'll also have that choice because if, if stamp duty is sitting there even on your second property, it's an impediment to move because you've got to obviously stump up tens of thousands of dollars. So what the change I've made is that you can you have that choice for your first home. You might live there for a couple of years. Then if you sell it and you go to your second home, well, you have that choice as well. Which you might stay in for you might stay 20 in for longer. Yep. So again, you can arbitrage back the other way. First home, you probably won't stay there very long. But you, you might, might go and pay stamp duty on your second if you think you can stay there for 20 years. So so that choice, although you, you might sit there and, you know, they 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 – they get their foot in the door with an apartment. They then might move to a small home, have children. So on their second home, they might keep that choice. But then by the time they've moved through and their income has increased over time, by the time they get their third home, that could be their dream home where they go, this is it, 20 years, I'm staying. Pay once. Well, then, then they'll pay the stamp duty. So it really gives them choices that suit their circumstances. And, uh, and I think uh, younger people today, and I often say this, younger people today, they can't afford to live where they're, where they're grown up usually. And and or they can't live afford to live where they want to live. So I often say to them, well, just just get in on the property market, go and buy in a regional area. It yep. doesn't make any difference. And live where you rent where you want to live, yep. with a couple of maids or whatever the case may be, share the rent. And then at least get in onto the property market. So I, that's another arbitrage process. And if you can then to go and double arbitrage the, the land tax versus stamp duty, you can save yourself quite a lot of money up front. It allows you to get into the property market quicker. So I, I, I really like that that policy. That's a great policy. And but what about renters? So I mean, some people never get out of the yeah. out of that trap. Yeah. And rent has got out of control. Yeah. I mean, my team here were out at a over for inspection the other day. There was a line of fifty meters long. They're going around talking to everybody, you know, what do you think, what do you think? How do we fix the rental problem here in New South Wales? Well, the first thing is I think goes back to that first point we made on we've got to build more homes um, to put downward pressure on rent. Uh, we outlawed last year rent bidding. So what we saw with some real estate agents is they were playing tenants off each other, prospective tenants off each other, increasing the price up. So we put an end to that. Then I think another a number of changes we've moved going forward. Firstly, that we're moving away uh, from no-fault evictions into reasonable grounds. So there's got to be a reasonable ground uh, for a landlord to evict a tenant. Secondly, um, going towards more standard contracts of three to five years. So obviously, as a landlord, you can you can uh, you'll, you'll negotiate with uh, your tenant, but in terms of a standard form, we can start to change the thinking of landlords, particularly that well, hold on, there is a benefit here. There's a benefit of having a longer contract in place, then that gives greater um, security as well to the tenant. And if you know that you've, when you've got a good tenant that you could lock them in for that period of time, I think that will really help our, our, renters, our renters as well and particularly young people. The, the other one is um, bond rollover. So by the, you know, when you put that bond in and then you go off to, to your next place, you've then got to save again then trying to claim your bond back. So we've got a bond rollover scheme now which we're, gonna, which we're bringing in which will mean that when you go into your next place, you don't have to. You don't have to save for that bond, particularly if you if you if you're cash poor. You've got you, you've got that just rolled over to help you with your uh, your next place. So th- these are the types of things that um, that we're working on. We do need greater protections in place for tenants, particularly in circumstances where more and more people are renting now. Yeah, it seems as though the pendulum has swung back in favour of the landlords, and of course, landlords are going to take advantage of it. You can't blame them. I mean, I, I guess. Well, they're struggling with interest rate yeah. rises as well at the, <laughs> at the moment. That's the worst thing. In terms of that. Um, you know, what do you, where do you see our economy in New South Wales? I, I don't mean it relative mm. to the rest of the nation. That's a different question. Mm. How do you see the economy in New South Wales given the circumstances we are currently in with 
you know, the Reserve Bank going hard on interest rates, um, probably relentlessly will continue to do so, irrespective of what's going on in the US um, in terms of those banks that went, went belly up. Um, I think the Reserve Bank is still going to try and control inflation, therefore yeah. they'll probably continue to at least hold the rates where they are or go one more, but they're not going to reduce them no. um, because they've got to control inflation. How do you see the New South Wales economy in that environment? Still confident, still confident. And I think a lot of the confidence or business confidence and consumer confidence um, has stayed pretty strong, particularly off the back of the pandemic. And I think that obviously was a very, what well, was a, I mean, I was, I was treasured during most of it. It was a really difficult time and many businesses thought they were going to close, but they all came, you know, so most of them came out the other side in a very strong position. I thought, well, if we can get through that. We can get through this. I, I do speak to a lot of small business owners um, and they say to me that, that the softer day is always the day after the Reserve Bank raised rates. So I think that that hits the confidence of consumers, but then they readjust. Um, and look, I think it's we're going to have some challenges and, and difficult times over the next 12 to 18 months, but I'm very confident we'll get through. Now, from an economic perspective as well, my job as, as the Premier is to continue to build the infrastructure. Um, th- just our public investment in infrastructure before the pandemic began was adding about half percentage point to economic growth. Hundred, I think over the next four years is around 160,000 jobs in New South Wales supported by that public investment. Now, we look at inflation, look at the challenge of interest rates. What's the flip side? Unemployment is at record lows, 3.1%. It's so now down at three the other day. It was the lowest in our state's history. So that you want a job in New South Wales, you can get a job. Um, so that's the best security that we can provide people. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm confident of the future just be, and based on where we, what we've gone through over the last four years, I think, uh, the headwind, there are headwinds here. I accept that, but I think we'll get, you know, we'll continue to come out of this in a, in a much stronger and more resilient way. I often travel out to the regions. I went out to Orange a couple of weeks ago and I went on the Great Western Highway, which is the Deputy Premier's, um, area. Yep. Um, whatever you call it, water, whatever it is. Yeah. And, um, I notice so much road work um, and obviously I listen to the local radio and they talk, the big debate is road work and uh, spending money, spending money. Um, do you ever, as treasurer, as a person who understands money mm. and treasury and responsibility of money in, money out, do you ever think to yourself, wow, in election periods we have to make so many promises that to some extent we might even be contributing to infl- inflation a bit in that, as you know, um, GDP has a lot to do with government spending yep. and uh, and government spending in Australia from COVID to now has been quite uh, crazy, like uh, both federal and every state, not just New mm. South Wales, every state. Do you ever think to yourself, we are contributing? Does that sort of play Absolutely games on you? It does. And so my focus is making sure the investments and the government spending we're making doesn't drive inflation. So you've got to put the investments in the area that matters. It's interesting, you know, during the pandemic, we we invested as a state around $50 billion. Now about half that was in our health system, about half that was in providing support for small businesses and people to help get them through. What we noticed at the end of all of that coming into, and I think it's probably one of the issues in, in relation to inflation, even when the Reserve Bank was increasing interest rates to curb it, the savings rates are so high. So even though... Even though inflation was rising and interest rates obviously trying to stem that, people were still spending because they had they had they had saved up a, they'd saved up a fair bit during during that period and there was a lot of government support. But it's important that we invest where it matters. So you, know, you look at some of those regional roads; so many have been impacted by floods. Oh, totally potholes everywhere. The, the roads are in bad condition. <laughs> yeah, they're shocking. So so these are the types of projects I think that don't have a significant impact on inflation to a degree. Um, but small projects working with councils, put about half a billion dollars with, in, into council so they could fix those potholes quickly. So that's a need. It's an important need. But at the same time, we just announced in regional New South Wales just a few weeks ago up at the National Party launch, we put a billion dollars into regional roads, but they need work. Um, so it's making sure as a premier when we and even in every budget we do the same thing, that we're very conscious of where those funds go. People have said, for example, some of our voucher programs, would, is that potentially going to help um, drive inflation? Now, I make it very – I make careful decisions in relation to where we actually put those funds uh, to support 
our families. And so things like going back to school where parents have to spend their money on the sh- on school shoes and school uniforms and textbooks. These are like necessities that everyone has to do. Well, then that's an area we can put money in. Playing kids sport, for example, our active kids vouchers and making sure that we help parents with the cost of living. But kids play sport, so it, so it helps. And that's not really a, a big driver. So the short answer to your question is yes, look at it and just make sure that spending is not in areas where it's going to drive up uh, inflation on on, on areas and that, that affect people's lives. Dominic Perrottet, the treasurer, how different is he to Dominic Perrottet, the premier? It's a good question. It's a very different job. It's a very different job. I mean, as treasurer, you know, you know, you're very disciplined behind the scenes, you know, and you, you, you learn about it. You, I always made it my way of knowing more, of, uh, tried to know more about the minister's portfolio than they did. So when they would come in and ask for funds. Which is very, what they do, they bid. That's what they do. We have a thing called, so we have cabinet and we yep. have a, a committee that the treasury chairs called the expenditure review committee. Yep. So, you know, they come in and they ask and they ask for funds. So you need to make sure that those funds are going in the right outcome. So when you're a treasurer, it's a pretty lonely place to be. You're not liked very much by your colleagues. You're like the CFO of an organisation. Yeah, it's a tough. You say no to everything. You say no to everything and they've really got to provide what, um, uh, an evidence-based approach to get the funding that they ask for. And I, I, one thing I've always believed, which is something unique about government compared to any other um, business, is governments seem to measure success on the size of the spend rather than the outcome that you're achieving. It's almost like, oh, well, the education budget's at record highs as if that's a good thing. Could you imagine if that with your, with your, with your household budget? Well, we're I mean, going through that conversation right now about defence federally. Yes. Exactly. Yes. As if it's like a, an accolade. Yeah. It's, it's not about it, it, the dollars need to be providing the outcome. That's, that's, the most important, um, that's the most important aspect. So then as Premier, look, Premier is different because um, you, you're very much out there um, listening to people understanding their concerns right across the state. And you get a real sense of where concern is on the ground, where the government can do more. Whereas as, as Treasurer, you're kind of in the back office, a little bit, a little bit more disconnected uh, from, from that. But um, what was the transition like for you though? What were the awkward moments? I mean, did you, did you, I, I remember watching you, I thought, yeah, he's got to get used to this. Gig. Yeah, it took a while. Yeah, you kept it, referring to her as a premier, by the way. Yeah, I, got, yeah, I, did, yeah I, know, I did. I did and I kept calling. And I, when I was with the, the, the now treasurer, Matt Keane, at events and I said, treasurer, I'd look. It took a while to, because I'd been treasurer for five years. So you kind that was kind of um, the title. But look, it, it took some time to transition, but it was also straight into it because um, I was in a bit of a natural place because we were opening up New South Wales at the time. Mm. From the from the pandemic, uh, this is pre- before Omicron. Yep. So so that was kind of my happy place. <laughs> yeah, it was sort of October, November, October. Yeah, yeah. and then we went. In, then we had Omicron. Yeah, um, and look, that was a bit difficult because I probably still had a very treasurer's mindset on the way I looked at and dealt with issues. I mean, we always had a balanced approach to our crisis cabinet meetings with with Gladys and with Brad Hazard. Um, and we, I think over through the pandemic, we got the balance mostly right. And, um, but there was a bit of a transition period, but I feel like over the last 18 months, I've grown into it more, like I've adjusted more to, which is the, you know, the, being, being at, in, in the front of the government, being responsible for every decision. I mean, that's, that's a thing. When, when you're treasurer and we're in those crisis cabinet meetings, We'd have different views, you know. Brad might think something, Glad think something, and I had I, I had a view. Ultimately, we thrashed it all out, and then Glad went out. She made the call, <laughs> and she made the call, right? And it's a bit when you go from being treasurer to premier, you're now in that position. Well, okay, I'm responsible. You know, I'll I'll listen to the yeah, but same situations Glad's in. I'll listen to the concerns that the different views around the table. Ultimately, it's my call. If it goes well, great. If it doesn't, ultimately, I'm responsible for that decision. Do you think, therefore, having been treasurer, that helps you do that? Because, you know, I remember when um, Morrison was a prime minister, he went from treasurer to prime minister yeah. and Josh became, became the treasurer. And I do recall 
I, I know, I can see, I don't know if they watch you, but I do recall some uh, conflict yeah. and budgets. Oh, definitely. And, uh, and you know, Scott was tough on spending. Yeah. Josh was a little bit more open-minded. There's, yeah. Yeah, if you know what I mean. Like, and uh, which is sort of the flip side of what it normally is. But I, I always put it down to the fact that Scott was the treasurer and he was very conscious of not overspending in terms of, you know, yep. deficits. And uh, Well, he was a surplus style guy. He was always looking for surpluses. Mm. Different territory, different time during COVID, et cetera. I understand that. Do you think that uh, you have the right tension in your party between Matt Coon as treasurer and yourself as premier? Yes. I mean, Matt, a good treasurer is always worried about the budget position. Mm. Uh, and in the five years I was in that role, you know, there were, we were in good times at the start and we were delivering big surpluses, totally. billions of surpluses. Um, and even then I was very strong on the financial management and making sure expense growth was under control. That actually helped us during those difficult times of drought, fires, floods, and the pandemic to be able to deploy because the state's balance sheet and that the financial position of the budget was in a really strong position. During that period of time though, um, I realized the importance of um, ensuring that we continue to invest to drive good social outcomes. So it was all about, well, where do you want to spend? W- what is the direction of the government? Now, my expectation with Matt, which he does, is he's being very fiscally disciplined uh, to get the budget back in a surplus by 24, 25. So that's what we're all on the same page with that. On the way through though, it depends. Like you look at, okay, well, where do we see the government priorities? My job as premier is to, is to set the priorities for the government. The treasurer's job is to find a way to fund them, uh, but in a way that, that makes sense and keeps the budget in, um, in a strong position. And I think that that tension between a premier and treasurer is a positive one. And uh, it's something that I think uh, we've worked well on together. The other thing I'd say about Treasury, which I came to the uh, view, is Treasury very much focused on the budget. So Treasury advice, very, very budget focused. They need to have a broader perspective on the economy um, and where are the areas of investing that's going to help drive economic growth. And so I think a couple of years into becoming treasurer, I appointed a chief economist in New South Wales. We appointed a productivity commissioner to really get treasury to have a broader perspective. Strategically. Strategically than just than just simply the budget management. If, if all of treasury is focused on doing one thing and that's keeping expenses under control and delivering a balanced budget, which is, in, which is important, but not having a broader outlook on the, on the, the state's economy and headwinds coming our way, then I don't think we get the best outcomes. So by the time I got to the end of the time in Treasury, it would be great because we would sit down um, with the members in the team and there'd be different views from the economics team to the financial uh, financial team. And I think that's kind of the best, that's how you put up a really strong Treasury that then has a view of, well, Yes, we're going to spend in certain areas and here's, here's maybe what the envelope is. But the economics guys would sit there and say, well, here's the best use of those funds to keep driving economic growth and provide jobs into the future. So I can bring a board of directors. Can I just ask you, I, I want to talk to you about Dom, Dominic yep. Pate, the guy, the yep. man. Um, he's got a lot of kids, yep. got a big family, seven kids. Seven, seven kids, kids yeah. The uh, youngest one is how old? Turning one tomorrow. Okay, awesome. Um, and uh, your oldest child? 13. 13. Um, how the hell do you manage? I just remember when I had four kids, that was bad yeah. enough. Um, but how do you manage your schedule? Not at the moment because it's a bit unusual at the moment, but yeah. just as Premier, how do you manage your schedule and manage home life? It's home tough. Life? It's tough. So, um, and if you ask, you know, what, what was the kind of transition, this was, a, this was a real difficult issue for me to kind of get on top of because it is, it, it, it's so consuming this job um, and I've got to make sure that when I'm at work, every minute is going towards outcome. Um, and then when I go home, making sure that I'm spending my time sw- as switched off as I can from work and focused and being focused on the kids. Now this might sound unusual, but this is just something that works for me and that's really scheduling time in. So I make sure that 
I have a date night with my wife every Monday night, non-negotiable. Mind you, we did miss it last week, but we are in a, as you say, unusual time. Do they accumulate? Does that mean she gets a Monday and Tuesday? Next oh, time? She'll, she'll get a payback, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, we have we, that's always that's always off, and and my phone is off, and my office know that on on a Monday night, so that's locked. Um, and then doing things with the kids where I take them out individually, so they've got their own special time with me. Uh, but it's still a challenge, you know. The, the the expectation in these jobs is that you're on twenty four seven, and that means, I guess, to some degree, some people get a little bit unhappy that you're not getting back to them straight away. But I've got to make sure that, you know, ultimately I'm a father and a husband before being a premier. Mm. That's my ultimate responsibility. And if you ask me what's the most important job for me, it's being a good father, it's being a great husband. And, you know, that's not, that's not easy and we all, you know, we can all do better in that. I'm not. I'm like everybody else. But if I if I get that right, then you know the the job looks after itself. But the other thing is is, is events. You know, I find that hard because there's an expectation now, almost like that you go to so many events at night, and and on weekends. I try and clear weekends as much as possible. As and and that is hard. One way I got around that is you have ministers who can represent you, and I always in, in the office. During the week, I'll do a pre-recorded voice message, a video message. Yeah. So that gets shown at at, at the events, and they and, and they appreciate that. But I, I guess you know it's it's hard because the expectation is from the community and from you and from um, ministers that you're around all the time. But you can't do you literally can't do both. You've got to find a way of doing it. There's not much in it between you and um, the leader of opposition, Chris Minns. There's sort of neck and neck, totally. And in a lot of ways, he's a bit similar to you. That I mean, there's this is not your normal the opposition leader hates the premier and the premier hates the opposition yeah. leaders or liberal vote hates labor they, they they actually he seems like quite a decent person and uh he speaks yep. well of you yep. and i speak well of him and you speak well of him and uh you have sort of similar backgrounds um you know catholic kids growing up went to catholic schools um nice families the whole thing um there's a lot of similarity between the two of you He's not as well known as you because you're the premier and have been the treasurer and at the front line. I mean, standing there during COVID all the time, sort of nodding your head when um the when the premier was speaking at the time, with along with the police commissioner. That sort of it helps your brand. Yeah, your brand got built quickly. His is nowhere near as um but built. Do you think he'd be in for a shock? Do you think he's ready for what you've experienced? Um, I I don't think anyone can appreciate how hard and challenging this job is unless you're in it. You, you just you just don't. And the hardest time in this job was both as premier and treasurer during that pandemic. and the and you know the the stress that you're under because you feel the weight of the decisions that you're making. And as treasurer, every job loss weighed incredibly heavily on me, and I needed to get them all back. It is a high pressure job. Um, that's incredibly challenging. Um, and I don't think you get a sense of that from opposition. From opposition, you see question time and you see a press conference. That's such a small part of the job um, that you don't really, I guess, understand um, until you're in it. But once you're in it, you, you, adjust, you adjust and and, um, and, you, and you learn and, and good politicians uh, do well in those environments. I come from a similar background to you in terms of schooling, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and, in fact, we have friends in common. Yeah. It's not so much these days, but there was a persi- period of persistent throwing in, in at your feet your beliefs, mm-hmm. your faith. Yeah. Hasn't been so much on the agenda, actually, during this campaign. I haven't seen much of it. Mm. How have you managed to deal with that? Because, for me, I see you as having sort of mellowed into the role of premier you seem to be much more open to everyone's ideas yeah as opposed to what i think i thought you might have been as treasurer coming into the premiership position has that been a difficult process for you or as and have you had any guidance or mentorship around that or do you just is, is this just dominic perrette adjusting 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 to be the person that new south wales expects him to be yeah my job my job as premier is to look after every person of their, or, or across New South Wales. 
I'm I'm the leader of every single person from metropolitan Sydney right across to regional uh, areas of the state, and you represent all of them, um, and you need to do that well. And there are different views and different perspectives. Um, I've I've probably learned in the time around cabinet um, to listen to different views and ultimately then form the view that I believe we we should take uh, we should take forward. But during, you know, I've had, but and my views have changed over time on things as well. Like you get different perspectives. You get different perspectives when you have children. Your your views constantly change. You know, it's not like a set and forget situation. Like you, you naturally evolve as a person. Your ideas change, and I've always been a, someone who wants to look at new ways of doing things to challenge the status quo, and that really drives me. And I think to some degree, the, but you know, people I think from the starts that had a very kind of strong view about who I was and and what I believed in based on and I've been, I think from being treasurer for five years I've probably had a perspective in relation to my views on being pretty tough on the finances of, of the state and 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 areas there but faith I mean you raise faith well faith is something that's, that's personal that's personal to me um but it's it's something that I thought at the start it was a bit the, the criticism was a bit unfair. I mean, I, I hadn't uh, kind of ever had that sense of criticism on something that was personal to me in my entire life. I'd never experienced that kind of sectarianism that um, that that I felt was uh, was there at the time. Um, but I think as I've been in the job, people have sat there and gone, oh. "He's okay." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not it's not an issue. But and we've got so many people of different faiths in our. Um, in our society, that's a great thing. I, I love our multicultural country. I love the fact that there are people with different views. That's something that we should celebrate. People pigeonholing other people and saying, "Oh, well, you you can't hold those views." Like, well, no, no, you can, and you can. And you know what else? You can respect that too. And I respect you for having a different view. Uh, and uh, and that's something I think that I, I've really started to enjoy a lot more in this role, particularly in those dis- in in those discussions where you have different views. You, you, you need to take other people's views on board and think about it and critically think about it. It helps challenge challenge the way that you look at an issue. Um, and I try and do that. If, you know, what, why are you saying that? What's your perspective? How are you coming to that, to that view on, on, on that issue? And if you can't convince your cabinet colleagues, if you can't convince your party room, you certainly won't be able to convince the public that doing something is, is, is right. And, but then, you know, other times, you st- that doesn't mean you get re- you, you don't have conviction. I'll give you an example of this, gaming reform, moving to cashless gaming in, in New South Wales. Um, I think when I – I probably had one member in Cabinet who, support, who, who, when I wanted to go down this path, supported it. Everyone was very, very concerned about the political backlash. The, the lobby. Yeah, the lobby, right? Um, so I knew I was starting from a, a long way back. But if you start with the principle that we have a problem and the approach that we needed to go was the right approach, then the question is how do you take people on the journey? And you do things in a way over time that makes people feel comfortable, then you can get the right policy outcome. By the time we landed on ending, getting to a point where we'd have all pokey machines cashless by 2028, I had a unanimous cabinet decision. Every single person supported that policy. Now in the party room, the first one, when you go all the way back then, it was, you know, it wasn't great. <laughs> there was, you know, there was a lot of concern um, at that time. But now members who were, con- who, who were concerned and opposed it then now come up to me when I'm out in their seats and say, hey, that position, it's really popular. <laughs> it's really popular on the ground. It's like, well, that's great. You don't do things because they're popular, but it just shows you take people on the journey, you listen and you've got conviction. I think you can take, you can get to the right outcome. I think it's just a, a systemic thing, but it's harder perception-wise to trust government. Yeah, because I think people, it doesn't matter, of any persuasion I'm talking mm. about, whether it's here or America, wherever it is, there is a just a, a view that it's hard to trust government. That people got some people are upset about COVID. It was very divisive. Lots of things have happened over the time. How does Dominic Perrottet, apart from saying trust me, but how do you build 
trust in the eyes of people in New South Wales. How how is the best way for governments to try and resurrect the trust say I had in a the New South Wales when I was um, you know twenty one because we just respect it automatically. I think the best way is to be open and as genuine as possible. When you make a mistake, you just own up to it. And I think if you say you've got something wrong, people will appreciate it. If you say a project is under pressure and is being delayed, you you don't hide that. You just come out and you say, look, here is the problem. Here is the problem we've got. Here's why. Now that might not make you happy, but here's why. And if you do, if you if you do more of that and you're upfront and honest with people, then I think over time that builds. I, I agree, Mark. The, the, the starting position is people don't like government and politicians and don't trust them. But my job is to kind of build that up. And I say if you're open and transparent and honest, I think because um, we know we're not we all make mistakes. We're not we're not we're not perfect. Um, and uh, if if you do that, I think that helps build that trust in in the community. People are always you know. Not everyone's going to agree with you and that's okay. But you get to a point where people go, well, I disagree with him on a whole lot of things, but I agree with him on that and that's okay. Do you think Dominic Perrottet and the Liberal Party and the Nationals, the South of the Coalition, are in a good position in terms of trust relative to this election coming up? Do you think it's where you want it to be? Because then you come off the back, unfortunately. I mean, it's unfortunately when you're in government, this is happened to the Labor Party a long time yeah. ago, many years ago, pre you guys, yeah. you come off the back of people making mistakes. And, you know, we've had, unfortunately, Barolaro's dramas. We've had, you know, Gladys had her issues, et cetera. It's a tough gig for you. Yeah, it builds up. Yeah. We're, we've been in government for 12 years. Yeah. Um, but is New South Wales a better place today than it was 12 years ago? I believe so. I think you're probably right. Yeah. And, you know, all of the schools and the hospitals that we've built, uh, navigating our people through a pandemic and, um, the motorways that are under construction across New South Wales, the metro trains, all of these things, I think builds a much better state. And I got into politics uh, for a good time to make a difference, to come in and make a difference. Uh, not a long time. Um, and I think that's that's what I'm, I, I want to make a real contribution why I'm here. And every four years there's, a performance appraisal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and that's how I see it. And I want to make a difference for the state. And I believe with my team, the Liberals and the Nationals, yes, we haven't got everything right. That's only natural after being in government for 12 years. But I think we've got the big decisions right. And I think the ideas, the energy and the experience that my team has will ensure that New South Wales keeps moving forward in a positive way, that we keep the economy growing, that we keep creating jobs, that we build the infrastructure to make a difference to people's lives and ultimately do what we all want. And that's to make sure that our kids and our grandkids have better opportunity and prosperity than we do. And that's what drives me every day. I'm going to put a full stop right there because I think it's appropriate. Premier, good luck. Thanks, Mark. Cheers. Chris Minns, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Thanks, Mark. Must be extraordinarily busy for you during this campaign. Like crazy. Yeah, big hours and long days, but mainly it's exciting and because you get to meet a lot of people, you get energy from them because, you know, they live interesting lives. So you do meet a lot of people and travel long distances, but for some reason we've got extra reserves of energy. Yeah, you'll probably be like that um, ever-ready battery though at some stage. You go, oh, hopefully it's after the election. Yeah. And, and and hopefully it's when you win the election. Like, you know, like I can't imagine what it would be like. You've got your wife, your kids, your, your supporters, your colleagues, your the whole team. The build-up of, not anxiety, the build-up of, of expectations to that one night when you're standing there and you either concede yeah. or you take the honours. Have yeah. you thought about that? I have a bit. I mean, generally speaking, I've decided to just put it out of my mind, anything beyond the 26th of March. And the reason for that is it's just, it feels too far away. And I know I've got like, for for example, tomorrow we've got a television debate with Perrote and I've got media interviews and I've got policies to release. So anything like three weeks away, I'm not even thinking about it. I'm just trying to do one Play with bit the at a time. Exactly right. So I, I, I do want to ask you a little bit later about, the machine sure. that sort of sits around you because, you know, th- these aren't 
sort of something that you just playfully go about your day and it's all well organized, orchestrated, yep. strategized, tactics, the whole thing. I do want to talk about that because most people never hear about that sort of stuff. 100%. But before I do that, I, you know, in front of me is a, is a relatively speaking, compared to me, a young man um, who's gone from. I'm, I'm not in as good nick as you are. But no, I don't know about that, out. mate. It's, it's, who knows what's going on the inside though. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you're a relatively young man, I'm saying. You know, you are. And um, you haven't been on the scene for a long time. Sure. And you, if I go back, cast right back to when you're a kid who was a, a Cogra boy. Yep. At Morris Brothers. That's it. Um, you did your, your uh, early years in Penzas, I mean, one of the Catholic schools around that territory. Uh-huh. Mum and dad's still alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how many kids in your family? I've got an older sister and a younger brother. Yep. And um, yeah. So you got come from a family. Did you grow up in Cogra <laughs> itself? The actual Grew up in Penshurst. Penshurst, yeah. And um, so always been in the St. George region. My wife and I lived in America for a bit, but mainly living in St. George. My kids go to the same school I went to and we're from a very close family. So every week my parents put on dinner for my siblings, girlfriends, boyfriends, best mates, drop-ins, oh, all cool. the cousins every single week. Old school. Every Wednesday night they get together at my parents' house and it's a big sort of tub of spaghetti or, or tacos or something like that, something's easy, and everybody turns up. Now I've, I'm absent a lot lately, but my kids grow up with their cousins as if they're almost siblings. It's a big rolling kind of family. That's- and I was from that too, Mark, like – at Penshurst, Maris, and Cogra Maris, I had a cousin in the year above. I had a cousin in the year below. I've got a ton of first cousins just sort of spread over southern Sydney. So because that, I mean, Maris Brothers is a Catholic thing. So, and, and you, know, our, 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 you know, your opposition, Perrottet, gets hammered a lot because of, um, you know, his religious beliefs, probably because they tend to try and put him in this Opus Dei thing and the extremism of Catholic, et cetera. But let's just park that for a second no one ever talks about Chris's Chris Minzer's beliefs or his faith. I don't hear you talk about it much. How important is faith? Like just generally, I don't. <laughs> I don't mean in an extreme sense, but just how important is faith? Because obviously, your family is a family of faith. Or would yeah, expect it is. Yeah. yeah, like my mum. My mum. My mum's Irish Catholic. She, um, she, church every Sunday. Yeah, no matter what, a whole life. Sure, never missed a never missed a day. Um, you know, and unfortunately I was, uh, I started missing days and she didn't, wasn't happy about it, but, <laughs> but I know how that works. There's no extremism though. It's just, mm. it's just our culture. Yeah. Explain it. Yeah. It's a bit of, I mean, it is a culture. It is. I grew up in, um, my parents are still practicing Catholics. One of the things that we found with our kids in particular is how do you get them to be part of like to live their life not just for themselves because everything that they turn on with television and everything they read is all about consumerism and buying and getting ahead for yourself and you kind of want to open them up to the idea that living life is actually about, you know, doing as much as you can for your community and for others and I've found that the church is great for that because its its main story isn't about um, look after number one all the time, every time. It's about, you know, other people in particular, you know, the poor and uh, less well off. So I think, it, you know, it gets a bad rap but it's been important for us and my wife and I, I mean, look, we're not, I don't come here and become a big evangelist for it. It's a personal thing and it's a family thing for us but um, it is part of our life. And you said we should park Dominic Perrottet's faith. We should. You know, he's been upfront about it but I don't see too many people going to make a decision about who they're voting for based on his religion or mine. Yeah, and it's funny because I heard you getting interviewed, I think it was Ben Fordham, but I heard you getting interviewed by Ben Fordham and you just said it's not right that people call out his Perrottet's religion as a reason not to vote for him or a reason to vote for you. I mean, it's and I agree, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, yeah. someone's got faith, got faith, no big deal. Yeah, and yeah. we've got faith in different things. We can't say one religion is better than another. Is, uh, you know, um, Muslim better than Jewish, better than Catholic, better than Protestant, whatever, Buddhism, whatever the color. Who cares? Yeah. The person's got a faith, leave it alone and just just leave it there. And it, it does it does ex, uh, exercise in my mind though this sense of family. Yeah. So how important you just mentioned, you, you know, your parents hold a function every Wednesday night where everybody's invited. How important is family to you? Because I, I think it's important that I understand, I'd like to understand anyway, um, 
what drives Chris Minns at the end of the day? Because sometimes you're going to have to make value judgments Mm -hmm. on decisions. Yep. And I'd like to know, is family an important part of that decision-making process? It is. It's very, very important. And it's funny when when you become leader of a political party, you don't generally as a member of the public or even a politician get asked about what motivates you or what, what, you know, what, what seminal events happen in your life. So you don't think about it very often really. Yeah. But it made me think about my own upbringing and the world that I grew up in, which was in Southern Sydney. Um, and it was just this very loving family home. I remember my mum telling me the, the other day, she's a lawyer. And she was a legal secretary at Freehills in the city. Or used to be the big law Freehills. firm, yeah. Yeah, big yep. law firm. We've all used them or had them against us, unfortunately. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, her old man said to her, why don't you become a lawyer? Like, I don't understand, you know, you don't have to be, you don't, if you don't want to be a legal secretary, you can be a lawyer. Why don't you go to night school and become a lawyer and we'll back you and we'll support you. He was a firefighter um, and he was, as a result, he was a shift worker. So mum went to law school at night, got a degree, got qualified, opened a law firm in Oatley and my grandfather was her receptionist. Really? Yeah, just answered the phone and That's... set up. All... Anyway, then her brother um, wanted a career change. He became a lawyer, joined the firm. The younger brother joined the firm. Cousins joined the firm. Still going, still in operation. My cousins run it now. But my mum's name is still on the, um, on the door and it's a beautiful story. Um, and the boys... My uncles ran the firm when mum went off and actually rejoined another firm in the city, but they kept her name on the door, like C.E. Uh, Caroline Elizabeth. And the reason was because they liked clients thinking it was the old man that started the firm, <laughs> not the older sister. It's good marketing, but like, but was that an inspiration? Is that a source of inspiration to you? I think the idea that the world's open to you, like, you, you know, you, you're really going to be, you could be self-directed. And if you want to change your circumstances, we live in this wonderful country with a world-class education system, just go for it. Grasp the nettle and, and go for it. I do think sometimes you need someone and there's a big distinction between getting a kick in the ass and have someone see something in you that you didn't see in yourself. And all of a sudden, as soon as you get that confidence, for a lot of people, you're off to the races. And I know that's my psychology as well. Has, has that happened to you though? So do, do you feel as though, you know, it was one of the the Labor, let's say the, the Labor Party faithful, as someone sort of said, Chris, I'm not effectively anointing you, but I'm telling you, you can become the leader of this party and one day become the Premier of this state. Did you? Was there anyone in the Labor movement who actually put their hand on his shoulder, uh, you know, not literally, but and said, mate, I think you can do this. Oh, look. Or was he parents? I mean, who yeah, was it? Yeah, I think the internal party politics are tough. And the funny thing about politics is often the competition occurs inside your own organisation. So it's a bit of a, sometimes it's a bit of a Spartan existence. Now, I've had some very close mates um, that I've gone through my time in politics with. Um, Steve Camper, who's a member for Rockdale, He's a very, very close friend. Rose Jackson, who's in the upper house. Like we, we, uh, you know, Joe Halen, who's, who's a shadow transport minister. We kind of all got elected at the same time and we're all on the back benches together and got together as a, as a, I wouldn't say a group, but we were close mates. And because you have a lot of setbacks and we haven't won an election in 16 years in New South Wales, we kind of needed each other to give a boost to confidence or, you know, say that it's possible. So it's really your contemporaries. Yeah. They give you the, let's call it the momentum to to do what you're doing. Particularly when we're on the outs. Yeah. Because, you know, for a big chunk of this, um, I wasn't leader of the party and, yep. um, uh, you know, we weren't considered, you know, in, in some time, at, at different points we've been persona non grata, you know. Well, well unfortunately, Labor Party, state, um going back 15, 16 years, sort of went into self-destruct mode. I mean, yeah. we had some terrible moments. Yes. I mean, and, you know, we don't get reminded, reminded of them very much anymore. In fact, you know, Gladys has just sort of gone through it herself yeah. as the former leader and, and you know, in, in relation to her relationship. And that has affected the Liberal Party. How does someone like Chris Minns, when he's putting his hand up, how do you think about what went down during the the Abids and all that sort of stuff? I mean, do you think to yourself, I've got to make a difference and I've got to make sure that shit never happens again? Yep. First one, acknowledge it. Like don't don't try and sweep it under the rug. 
or yep. say to people, I don't know what you're talking about, or that was a long time ago. Like acknowledge it straight up. It was appalling behaviour. And we breached the public's trust and the people that did the wrong thing deserved to have the book thrown at them. So that's number one because you don't even get to first. A, it's true, and B, I won't even get to first base in this election campaign unless I admit and acknowledge that it was shocking behaviour. We've got ICAC in New South Wales. It's an important institution. Mark, I reckon ICAC being uh, in operation in New South Wales actually stops a lot of corruption before it even begins because a lot of people go, Oh, um, you know, people make bad decisions, particularly people in power, and sometimes it's venal decisions. But if you're concerned about a cop on the beat that's always there, it maybe it'll tip you into doing the right thing. So we want to make sure it's properly funded and independently funded. And is um, that like an election part of yeah, your campaign? Yeah, it is. A, it is a, it's a campaign commitment. So yeah. do take me through that then. What does that mean? In yeah. Terms so of at the moment, funded? if you talk to different commissioners going back, they'll say we've got a budget. But investigations come, I don't want to say in fits and starts, but they might come in waves. So there might be three or four major inquiries that they need to take place in one year. They've only got funding for one or two. So they've gone in the past to government and said, we need more funding. We've we've spotted more corruption might be in local government or in the state government, but we can only do this one inquiry. So we're going to set up a structure where they can apply through the ICAC, um, uh, uh, the, the... inspector general to apply for more funds and therefore receive them almost like an emergency grant so they can conduct more inquiries. At the time, at the time that there's in something in front time, of them. Right. In real time. As opposed to being stuck with a budget and that's as much as you can spend. Oh, sorry, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all we're going to do. So you're trying to, you, part of your campaign is building some flex in how you fund inquiries so that a budget doesn't stop an inquiry where, where it's warranted. That's right. And, and the other thing is, and I'm not inferring this with the current government, I'm genuinely not, but you could have a situation in the future where a, a government says, the ICAC says, well, we need to conduct more inquiries and they know bad things are going on and they say, they say, sorry, money's dried up, knowing that they don't necessarily want people in their organisation poking around. So we can't have that situation. You know? so, so could just explain to me as a voter, why is that important to me? So, I mean, I, I understand the philosophy of it, but um, I'm, you know, I'm in business, you know, I've, I've got all the business pressures in the world, I'm just pitching myself as an individual perhaps, Um, why would that be important to me? Explain, take me through that, take me to why that's an important aspect of your campaign. Yeah, I mean, look, in the first instance, integrity in public office is really important because if people all of a sudden regard that there's no rules in place, there's no scrutiny, there's no oversight, well, you end up having the worst examples around the world of kleptocracies where someone comes in and basically robs the joint blind. In a more practical way, if you're a taxpayer in New South Wales, you're saying all this integrity corruption stuff, it's your money. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, New South Wales is the biggest taxing government, the highest taxing government of any jurisdiction in the entire country. So we collect a lot of dough from you as an individual. And if it's being manipulated, either siphoned off to private companies or pork barreled into a particular electorate, or it's not being used to the benefit of the state but personal the personal benefit of an individual, well, I mean, you can just imagine you, no one's handing it over for corrupt use. So I, I think everybody's got a personal financial stake in corruption because if you look at longitudinal studies about when corruption gets into the marrow of a government or a society, it ends up ripping off taxpayers. As a, you know, if, there's, if it's a personal financial motive, that's one of them. Now that's very interesting because I think you might be hitting on a, from from a from my side of the table a, v- a really important point. It's about trust. Yeah. And uh, do we trust the government? And uh, I mean, we've been through COVID, and a lot of people mistrust the government as a result of things we're told to do. And obviously, there's errors made and judgments having to be made at the, you know, where situations occur that have never, you know, occurred before, and we have to make calls. People have to make calls, and we saw it at the federal level, also at the state level, and. Uh, and as a result, of that, I think there is a general change in the way we view government. When I was a young guy, government was government, like they were gods. Um, but over time, we started to realise that they're human too because it's made up of individuals and they make mistakes. So at a minimum, we don't want them making repeating mistakes or at a minimum, we don't want them being dishonest. Yeah. You know, because you've been watching this stuff from the sidelines sure. to some extent. Yeah. Um, now you're the leader though. Of the opposition, how important is it re-establishing trust for Chris Minns as a leader of this state? I think it's all important, and you've really hit the nail on the head. Uh, and 
when it comes to government in New South Wales or Australia, trust is so crucial because we rely on the government to provide um, services to the state, but we also want them to make their best judgment. And if all of a sudden the people believe that that best judgment's being compromised or uh, that there's malignant influences on it, financial or corrupt or otherwise, then they're not going to trust the government to do or act in the best interest. Now, the biggest and best lever we've got in this country is democracy. Throw them out. Um, and that's important. Even if you don't end up throwing out the government, it's important to have that what do they call it? The sword of Damocles hanging over a government. That, so if they stuff up, they're gone. Absolutely. And if you look at countries around the world where there isn't democracy, there are high rates of corruption and, and malfeasance in their, in their administrations. So that's number one. There are also important levers that we've got, parliamentary democracy and all the rest of it. Look, I, I, my experience, it's a funny thing, right? I used to live in America for a bit. Australians are a lot more skeptical, somewhat cynical about politicians. You know what I mean? And they are not, they don't treat politicians like gods and they shouldn't. Absolutely not because it's just made up of humans who make mistakes. But the funny thing is I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've copped a abuse or an earful from someone in the public. Like they're going to put you on a short leash, Australians. They're going to demand that you act in their best interests. But generally speaking, most Aussies want their governments to succeed and they want the the, the state to do well. Like there's not that massive cleavage in society that you see in America or in England or in other places. Like most people in this country are Australians before they're supporters of the Labor Party or Liberal Party. I think that's starting to be the opposite in places around the world. Just sitting in that chair a couple of years ago was – uh, Morrison and uh, just before the election, uh, which he lost, um, and uh, Albo won. And um, one of the things, my observation, and it's turned out to be the case, is that Morrison came across as not someone you could trust. I'm not saying you could or you couldn't, I'm just saying came across that way as it turned out. And also, um, Albanese came across as someone very likable, um, which is quite interesting. And uh, I first met you, I'm sorry, having, you were having a cup, a cup of coffee with somebody and uh, and the first instinct I came that, that I said to a mate of mine was he seems like a pretty good bloke, like pretty likeable. Um, and that sort of helps me trust someone a lot better. For some reason there's a likability about you. Is that Chris Minns really the dude or is that Chris Minns? Because you there was no election call when I met you. Yeah, of course. You, you were just yeah, yeah. You, were, you were the opposition guy, leader yeah. opposition, and uh, you just said, "Hey, go, Mark, blah blah. Here's my number. You want to talk to me? Whatever. Nothing in it. No agenda. No, no big deal." And I thought that's pretty unusual. Yeah. Like a uh, openness, a certain openness, which you don't get in politics today. Yeah. I don't see it very much. But Dominic maybe is not as open as you are. I don't know. I mean, look, there's a there's a bit in that. I think the first thing is I was always taught to take the job seriously and I do take it really seriously but I don't take myself too seriously and I don't think you can really be a working politician and have some high and mighty view of yourself and because the journos bash you up and members of the public, you know, tell it to you straight and all of a sudden if you've got some lofty view of yourself, you're inflated by the end of the day. So I um, I like engaging with people. I don't, I don't, it's not my style to come in all high and mighty and tell you how to run your business or explain how, you know, the ins and outs and every, of everything. We, we try and approach the election campaign in a hungry but humble way. And I always say that to my candidates, be hungry but humble. Show the voters that you want it, like you want the job, you give it to me. It's like an employee talking to the manager. The manager in this instance are the voters. So you want to go to them and say, give me work, give me work. I, I want to do the extra hours. But you've got to be humble about it too. Um, so that's our motto, our sort of not public but internal motto for the election campaign, hungry but humble. And I think that's a reflection a bit of my personality, or at least I hope it is. Um, and I think that's probably one of the great things about Australia is that you can have political leaders where, you know, you can see the Prime Minister walking down the street and it's not a big deal. I've got a mate who's a um, former world surfing champion named Rusty Miller and he lives in Byron and if anyone from Byron up there, they'd know Rusty. And uh, he said, left America during the Vietnam War, surfing around the world 
ended up staying in Byron Bay because he was walking down the street and Gough Whitlam was walking the other way. And he was by himself, no media, no security guards. And he goes, how good's the country where the PM can just be walking down the street? And he goes, that's it. I'm calling Australia home. And he's been here for so. He's American? Years. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's American, yeah. yeah. Well, that, it is, uh, that is very Australian. And I, my gut feeling, my, my sense is that you're sort of very representative of Australia. I mean, you, the way you dress, I mean, I don't know. You just, you, you, cause you're sort of cutting a, a, a pretty good figure, relatively speaking, being approachable, open. Um, I think you build that trust thing pretty well. But I guess also on top of that, though, we need to know about your policies. Sure. So policies during election campaigns seem to be getting dropped every day. <laughs> like yeah. we're going to spend money and this is going to spend money in that. And it's a bit of a, and I said, it's a bit of a gamesmanship going on there. What are the maybe three or four things that a state led by you under a Labor Party, what are the, say, four or five things that you are going to make sure you change in New South Wales? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, I'll, I'll run through a couple of them and then I want to speak, speak about one in the end, which I think is important, which is financial management. So number one, we're going to put a toll cap in place, tolls particularly for tradies and those that live That's in Western. That's a big deal. City. Massive. Massive. I've spoken to families that pay five grand a year, six grand a year in tolls. We're the most tolled city on the face of the earth. So $60 toll cap put in place. Secondly, we want to bring back domestic manufacturing and that means investing in vocational education. Um, in 2010, 2011, it was about 52, 53,000 apprenticeships that year. We're down to about 24, 25,000. Now the skilled economy, particularly in the building industry, is at record lows. You just can't find tradies. And I've got this view growing up in the suburbs in Sydney that if you get to a point where you've got vocational education, people can get a trade, they can get an apprenticeship, that's the government's role in part, but after that's over, you want to just slap them on the back and go, go for it, start your own business, back yourself, and eventually you'll employ your own apprentices and the cycle starts all over again. So we're committed to that. We think we've got to build up vocational education. If you look at sort of Germany and Singapore who've got low tariffs and have got free barriers effectively with the rest of the world when it comes to trade, they all put a lot of emphasis and time and energy into that kind of education. Is that about building TAFE up then as the educational uh, institution to do this trade work for In you? part, but we also want to make sure that we're working with, um, for example, train builders. We've, got, we've been building trains in New South Wales for 120 years. We've been importing them a lot over the last uh, 12 years in New South Wales, but they keep breaking down. And there's a way of doing it where you've got good, well-paid jobs and a growing economy. But I think skills are a big part of it and that's part – I think Labor does skills really well and I think it fits nicely with a growing economy where you got good, well-paid jobs. Um, that's uh, two. <laughs> that's two. What I did want to speak to you about is is debt in, in New South Wales. Well, as in government debt? Government debt. So we've got about $180 billion worth of gross debt in the wow. state, which is over 20% of GSP. When the government was elected, it was about 30. I think it was even less than that. Um, not 30% of GSP, it was about $30 billion. So the interest on that debt's about $6.8 billion a year. Um, now that's on the recurrent side of the budget, which means you've got to find that money every single year. doesn't matter what happens with the debt levels, that interest has to be paid off. So if you keep adding to that in sort of infinitum way, the interest bill increases. And we've identified a lot of spending from the government. I was out today talking about belt tightening, making choices about, where governments spend money because we know we've got to put it into essential services but I can't have a situation where debt runs out of control, particularly with the high interest rate environment because it just becomes more expensive to service the debt. So in terms of – and what about small businesses? You talk about tradies and I think that's a great one or, or apprentices for, for tradies and yeah. then those apprentices become tradies and employ more apprentices. But what about small business? So small business in Australia, New South Wales but every state – particularly New South Wales, has been smashed as a result of, result of COVID. Yeah. Are you guys thinking, and traditionally Labor doesn't think about this, I mean I, I'm not having a crack at you, but no, that's sure. a traditional Labor mm. thing, but what is Labor thinking or what's your party thinking about how do we help these small business owners out? I mean I, you just announced a toll thing. That that's That cap on the tolls is a really big deal because, yep. by the way, small businesses, at least of the 2.2 billion uh, million small business owners in Australia, 1.2 million of them are one-off tr tradies, electricians, contractors, yep. all of whom are 
out Leamington and they're driving to, uh, I don't know, Cronulla or something like that mm. and they've got to go through tolls and they're paying a fortune, is that there's a big blow-up. So that's a good one. What other things are going through your mind about how do I help small business owners? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the big things we need to do and we're going to establish is a small business bureau. Steve Camper, a member for, Cam- uh, yep. for Rockdale, talked about him earlier, started with his brother and his old man in accounting business. We've actually recruited quite a few business people with a small business background as candidates, which are not not from traditional backgrounds for candidates for the, lab, for the Labor Party, but we all decided that we wanted to have a more rounded group of people who are going to put their hand up for Labor from a different parts of the economy, which I think is exciting for us. And it means that we've it's got It's different people. too. Yeah, it's different. And it means that they're at the table saying we, we we've got to think about how this will impact on every segment of the economy, not just one or two. Um, So the Small Business Bureau, there's just way too much red tape when it comes to the, for the ability, particularly for small businesses to navigate, whether they're cafes and they want to get an outdoor license for alfresco dining, they have to go through the local council, they get a a permit from the state government as well. So we've looked at many ways of streamlining and taking out a lot of that bureaucracy and red tape. And I could read you the list of government agencies that are responsible for planning in this state. And if you're a moderately sized building company, for example, you've got to have competencies with the minister responsible, the other minister responsible, the Greater Cities Commission, the Greater Sydney Commission, local planning panels, the local government, the Land Environment Court. Look, what's happening is a lot of private capital is organising itself and saying it's just too difficult to do business in Sydney, for example. We'll go to Brisbane in particular, which seem to have streamlined processes and, and have become attractive for inbound capital. So we've got to be careful about this stuff. Your seat, you're sort of just hanging on. Yeah, your seat. I am. How, yeah. How's that going? Yeah, it's tight. Cogra's tight. Um, we had a redistribution between this election and the last one. But the last one, um, I had a young candidate against me who was a firebrand and, and did very well. And um, so it's close. I had a redistribution and it went down to 60 votes. But I made it clear to the party and my constituents in Cogra that I'd rather not be in politics if I wasn't the member for Cogra. Now, it's their choice if they want me or not, but I'm not swapping seats. I'm not going to ditch my electorate and try and get a safer electorate somewhere else. I think I'm the best candidate for the seat of Cogra and I'm going to fight for it, but I'm never going to swap. I love the electorate of Cogra. What's the machine that sits behind Chris Minns? What's it look like, Chris Minns, who's trying to be the leader of the state, you know, and is currently leader of the opposition? Give us an insight into what that looks like. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty lean, Is and it? uh, it's my personal staff. So press secretaries, chiefs of staff. We've got economists and policy directors, but it's no more than ten or eleven. Oh, really? Yeah, super, super small. Um, and that's meant that we've we've really focused on the things that we believe are crucial for for the people in New South Wales, rather than you know we wanted to make sure that we've got. We've got a real deep understanding of the budget process and where the economy's going and where jobs and skills will come from, and we've built them up as a as our you know priority. Party office, the Labor Party office that handles research and candidate selection and all the rest of it, and um, there's a big logistical exercise in making sure everybody's on the same page, not just once a day, but three or four times a day. What are the libs doing? What are we doing? What are we doing in response to what the libs are doing? Yeah, the tactical stuff. We've been pretty clear on strategy though. I mean, what I'm talking about, cost of living, skills, domestic manufacturing, education, health. I was talking about when I got the leadership. I'm talking about it today. I suspect I'll say it the day before the election. And if I win on election night, that's what we'll talk about too. So we've really said the unique selling position for Labor is about economic opportunity. The Greens have got their thing. The Libs are about sort of big business. The Nats, I don't know, the Bush. For us, it doesn't matter what your parents did for a living. There's no limit to your potential in Australia. That's when we're at our best. When Labor's at our best, we're talking like that. Opportunity, ambition for you and what what we can do to make sure that you meet your full potential. And I guess that's what drives me. I'm excited by that. And if I can animate that spirit inside Labor, I mean, I think we've got a real shot. Chris Minns, thanks for your honesty, but by the way, thanks for your straight talk, mate. Straight up. Mark, I really, really enjoyed it. I I listen, I watch the podcast and I listen to it and it's fantastic. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good luck. Thanks, mate.